So, okay. Sisters in Christ. Oh, yes. 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 All right, all right. Good morning, church. So good to have people here in the house of God today. Amen? We are grateful for what the Lord is doing. Bobby, what are you doing over there? Bobby Asher, everybody look at Bobby Asher and just make him comfortable today. Just give him a, your a full attention and your focus. That's right. No, I love it. I'm so, yeah, best beard in the room. Just hands down. Martin, you get number two. All right. I'm so grateful that we are here today. God is good. He is faithful in and throughout every season, is he not? So we're excited to just let you know if you're new with us today, uh, we have a, a connection card, if you want to call it that, just to put some information on because we want to get to know you. We want to have some time and fellowship with you. We are the family of God together. We don't want you to just come and, and be missed. Uh, we notice you. We recognize that you're here for a purpose. God brought you this far, so let us get to know you and see what the journey uh, in the future holds together. But uh, by putting that information on the card, uh, we also have a private Facebook group that we can help you join, and uh, that'll keep you up to date with communication of what we're doing and, uh, and all the events that are coming, uh, which leads me to the next event, which is Freedom Session. That starts today. I'm wearing my shirt. My wife's wearing our shirt. This is our love, our passion. We are so grateful to, for the opportunity to speak healing and uh, bring discipleship into the lives of so many. And uh, even tonight uh, and through the day, uh, all the way across the nation, so many are meeting together, gathering together, looking for that emotional health in their life, letting God di disciple them and work through and be held accountable to grow into the people of God that he's intended for us to be. No matter what's been done to you, no matter what you've done to others, God's forgiveness is so great. He just heals he heals. He doesn't just recover. He heals. He makes new. All things are new in the name of Jesus. Amen? So we are so excited about that. Little updates. We are so excited. Uh, the, the pump's getting replaced this week. Uh, we have the, uh, so we'll have better water. Have you ever noticed that when you flush the toilet, it just takes about, I don't know, five minutes to recover? <laughs> So that's going to change really quickly around here. So we're excited. I should have noticed that a long time ago. So, but uh, Art's uh, one of the gentlemen that uh, he's so graciously put us on his schedule. How many know it's actually to the guys in the room and gals, when you want to get a well taken care of, that is like difficult in this area. So uh, for him to put us on the schedule within a couple weeks uh, is uh, truly a miracle. So uh, we're going to get that done. Uh, we are just sanding through the last little touches, all the sheetrock's in, the power's in, then the carpet's going in as soon as we get the paint in, if anybody wants to help with that. We're so excited to get that to its uh, final stages, then get our kids uh, and our uh, space uh, available. Uh, yeah, this week's our, our hope uh, to really push that through. But uh, God is good. He is faithful. If you want to give to the church uh, for any of the reasons, building fund, benevolence, or honor the Lord with your tithe and offering, we do have that in the back there. Uh, we don't try to put pressure on, but we recognize that it's an obedience and an act of obedience to the Lord when we do. And uh, he will bless you. He really will. He'll bless you anyway because he's God. But he has room to bless us uh, in the midst of our giving. So without further ado, I'm so excited because... I love when Rick Leahy comes to me and says, today, I think the Lord's put something on my heart to share. And so I'm excited to hear what he has to say. Would you give? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> not that I forget anything ever. This is Evelyn Pratt, ladies and gentlemen. Come on up. Okay. Good morning. I have the privilege of announcing that next Sunday morning, we will have the Matsiko World Orphan Choir with us. If you want to see an energetic performance, this will be it. They are, they, we actually get to have them for their first performance in the U.S. So that's going to be exciting for them. And um, from here, I think they travel to Portland and on across wherever they've been invited to go. And uh, what they're doing is they're um, creating sponsorship through you folks for other orphans. Uh, this group 
this year or next week is from Liberia. And one of the children that I sponsor might be with the group. I haven't heard definitely, but that will be really neat. Um, anyway, we need to feed them. Uh, for next Saturday evening. They come in at about 4 p.m. Saturday, and we need to serve them dinner and then breakfast and lunch the next day. Um, we will have dinner ready and cooked for them. The next day, they will have people that can prepare the breakfast and the lunch. Uh, anyway, I have sign-up sheets if you would like to help with that. Um, so they'll be on the back table. Please put your name on the, on the little line here and your phone number in case I need to reach you. Um, I don't know how to get you my phone number if you need to reach me. Okay. So Evelyn's going to write her phone number on the top of the sheet so that <laughs> you can take that and write it down as well. And, uh, and then put your phone number so we can connect back and forth. But yeah, they have a very specific diet. We're, we're going to honor that and uh, help with that. And so anybody that has that hospitality and love uh, in their heart for them. But thank you, Evelyn, for putting that together and organizing it. I'm very excited to hear 24 beautiful little children singing to the Lord. That's just going to be a joy. Uh, but they are going to stay here. Uh, we got the upstairs kind of ready, and there's we're going to uh, have all that time and opportunity so uh, we can kind of come and just get to know them. But how many know that perfect religion is the care for the orphan and the widow? So our opportunity to just let the Lord touch your heart heart in this area. So now, like I was going to say, but this is the time that I should have said it. We are so excited. Rick Leahy, I, I'm just looking at him. He's right over here. He's just a man of God with a halo on, over his head, or maybe that's his white hair. But either way, have him come up and share today what the Lord has put on his hair. I mean, on his heart. That's right. Back. Okay, now I'm turned on. You can hear me. <laughs> I'm glad that we have laughter. That puts me at ease. It puts you at ease. And that's what I want you to do. And how many like this picture up here? Nice. Yeah, I, I did that for several reasons. One is to remind me of several things. One is we get older, we need glasses because our arms get shorter. And I used to be able to put it on the floor and read it, but I can't do that now. So I'm going to put these on. I'll probably just leave them on. And uh, another thing I put that up there for, if you, we have a website on YouTube for messages. Yeah. And if you're like me, you type in Church in the Woods, and about 20 things come up, and some of them are downright creepy. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if you type in CITW yeah. before or after Church in the Woods, it's right at the top of the page. I'm just going to tell you that because I had to call Pastor Chris several times. How do you get to the website? <laughs> okay. And another thing is, how many, anybody here know sign language? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know what it means for sure. But if you see me do this today, it's because we're having technical difficulties and I don't have a clicker to change the slide. <laughs> So Sherry will be back there, and she'll be changing the slide one at a time as it go. And yeah, also this picture reminds me of my time in West Virginia. Anybody from there? Okay, good. Well, I got one here. I'll talk about him in a minute. But uh, it, it reminds me of a church in, in West Virginia. I lived, I, the church I went to is literally didn't have an address, but it was at the fork of Wolf Creek and Crooked Run Road. <laughs> About, if there, there was a town about 10 miles away, maybe, maybe 200 people total. But uh, it also, it reminds me of, of so many things. And how many knows what the hills and hollers are? In the Northwest, we have mountains, hills, and we have valleys. In West Virginia, you have hills and you have a holler. <laughs> there, there's usually one street, one street going through town with buildings on each side, and that's, that's it. And some people believe, I, I, used, I came from Texas when I moved to West Virginia, and I had people come from Texas, and they, some of them just, they, they really believe that if you laid West Virginia out flat, it would be bigger than Texas, <laughs> because it is nothing but hills and that. But enough of that. I'd like you to take your Bibles and open your Bibles you know, Pat, last week, Pastor Chris had mentioned about the church, what it should be known for, and not for what it's against. And as I was thinking about CITW, I think it should be known as church in the word. 
And I would, I would encourage you. I know life takes so many things out of it. We have all these modern conveniences that take our time, that take our energy. And we have work, we have families. But we need to be in the word. Yeah. At a bare minimum, you have a phone. Put an app on there once a day. A, a, a verse will pop up. And read that, it'll, it'll, it'll get to your heart. And it won't be long, you'll think, well, what's that verse mean? What's around it? You'll be reading the chapter. And then you'll be reading more. And I'm guilty too. I get busy sometimes. But I just encourage that, be, that we be known for church and the word. So if you take your Bibles and turn to page one. And if you're not sure where that is, just look for Genesis and you'll find it. I'm going to read one verse out of there and then I'm going to... So go back, I'm going to go to John and read and hold that spot because I'm going back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. Going back to Genesis 1, skipping down to verse 14. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Father God, Creator God, just ask today that you would minister to our hearts. Lord, I can put things on paper and I can think about things, but Lord, I ask your anointing to be here. Open every heart to hear, every mind to, to take action. God, that we walk closer to you and seek you more and understand you even more. This day and every day, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> She's good. Okay. So this message today, if you haven't figured it out, well, first of all, I want to say this. You know, when, I don't know about everybody else, but when I'm to speak, and I think, what do I speak to the future bride of Christ? What do I say? And I asked the prayer team a few weeks ago to pray for me because I was anxious. I didn't know where I was going. I had all these things coming to my mind, and I just wasn't sure. What, what would you have me speak, Lord? And the next day or two, he gave me a direction. And that, that's always a good thing. But when you get a direction and sometimes you get to thinking about it and these things come to your mind and I don't know about you, but I use my phone and I'll just speak in a thought when it comes to my mind so I don't forget it. And I still was anxious. And last week, Sunday morning, we had a tongues and interpretation. Does anybody know, remember what it was? But it said, look unto the heavens, look unto me. And that's where I want to look today. I want to look into Christ. So when, we, when I talk about this message, it's going to be about time. It's going to be about God's greatness through time. It's going to be about the appointed times and also the signs of the time where we're living. I looked up the word time, and it appears 612 times in the Bible through 560-some verses. And different phrases. It's got former times, appointed times, a set time, the fullness of time. The one I could not find is, it's about time. <laughs> you know, if someone, when someone's excited, that oh, my son just moved out and got his own place. That's great. And then you find out he's 35 years old. You know, well, it's about time that that happens. <laughs> you know? And in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, if you hadn't heard the song by the, by the birds, most of you never even heard of the birds, but it talks about a purpose every purpose, a time for every purpose under heaven. And I'm going to read several of them. There's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and there's a time for harvest, a time to kill, which I hope that never has to happen, but there's also a time to heal. There's a time to tear down, and a time to build up. There's a time to weep, and a time to laugh. And today we've had plenty of laughing. There's a time to mourn, but then there's a time that, to dance and celebrate, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose. There's a time to keep, and there's that hard one, a time just to let it go, let go. A time to be silent, and a time to speak. Amen. There's a time of war, and a time of peace. 
Uh, thank glad you said amen because I told Bill if I lose track, he's supposed to jump up and say, help him, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so the slide there is going to be coming up. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows the handiwork of God. How is that possible? Hebrews 11.3 says, by faith we understand the world were framed by the word of God. So things which are seen are not made of things that do appear. I walk through the woods, I pray, I look outside, I see the plants, the bushes, and I'm, man can talk about, they can create so many different things, but they can't create something like something from nothing. You have to have a starting point. Only God does that. It was mentioned this morning, even in our, our prayer time, Isaiah 46, these words declare, I am God there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, it's about time that we examine the greatness of God. Now, if you look at that screen and you see the, the, the scripture text, you'll think, it doesn't say that. John 4.24 says, as soon as I bring it back to my memory, God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him spirit and truth. In the great expanse of time throughout the universe, God fills all space and all time. God's a spirit. He is everywhere. He was there in the beginning. He's here right now, and he'll be in the end. Although there is no end, that's why it's called eternity. And since I was a child, I've looked up into the heavens. That's supposed to be a representation of our Milky Way, our galaxy that we, we live in. And there's between 100 and 400 billion stars in our galaxy. And I don't know how many of you, here we usually don't see it. There's been a few times in the last couple of weeks we've been outside, my wife and I, and we're looking up and it's just so clear. Not only can you see the stars you know, but there's billions of other stars that you usually don't see. And there's one star that I always look for. I look out my, from my house, I can look, and I know exactly where the North Star is. I can look at the trees, and I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be right there. When the leaves are gone, I know it's right there, because that North Star does not move. Very little variance. Of course, when I say it doesn't move, our Earth rotates a little bit on its axis. But it's always there, and it's been a guiding star for generations of navigators through time. They've looked, where's the North Star? Which way is going north? It's also called Polaris. And that one star from us is about 425 light years away. And I think about that and the brightness of it. And just to give you a point of reference, a light year is estimated to be, if you're traveling at the speed of light, about 5.8 trillion miles. Now, it doesn't sound like much compared to our national debt, <laughs> but, but it's a long ways. Okay, all right. So I, I figured out the math in about six years. If we could print dollar bills at the speed of light, it only takes six years <laughs> to pay it off. But to bring you in a little bit closer, or for a better reference, light travels at the speed of 186 miles, excuse me, 186,000 miles a second. When we see the light, the sun coming in, it takes approximately eight minutes to reach us on Earth. It's 93 million miles away. To bring you in yet closer still, if you've seen the moon at night, it doesn't shine light, it reflects light. That's what we are. We're a reflection of his light. It takes just a little over one second for that light to hit us. Traveling at the speed of sound, if you were to travel around the earth, you could do it seven and a half times in one second. It's 200, well, from the moon, it's 238,000 miles away. And I don't know about you, but I bought a car 17 years ago, and I just turned over 240,000 miles. It took me 17 years. It takes God that quick to get here. <laughs> if I had a clicker, I'd just click it. You'd never notice. <laughs> Recently, there was an article, a news article about a nebula. A star, it's a star forming regions in our galaxies nearest to the Milky Way. It's also known as the local group. It's only 161,000 light years away. And I saw this picture and there's a new web, I believe it's the web telescope that's up there in space taking these pictures. And 
I look at that picture and I think to myself, well, I didn't think to myself, I look to the scriptures. He counts the number of stars. He calls them by name. Great is our God and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. It's so far beyond us. I look at that and I just think, we have a God that not only can reach across time and across space, but he's here right now to do the impossible. We look at things and we think that's impossible. It can't happen. It's not going to happen. But I submit to you, anything is possible with God because he is so big. And how does he do it? Hebrews chapter 6 tells us, but without faith, faith is that substance. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that it's a reward of those who diligently seek him. And I, I want to seek him. I'm going to the next slide. And it's about time we examine God's greatness in forming us. We talked about his greatness in the heavens, but now about his greatness in forming, forming us. Psalms 139, 14, as you can read, says, I will, make, I, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul, and that my soul knows very well. The unique thing about us, over all the other created beings in the, in the universe, is he poured into man a soul. A soul that is so valuable to him that he was willing to robe himself in human flesh, walk as a man, live as a man, and give his life as a man that we could have redemption. Last week, Pastor Chris talked about the body of the church. We talk about we need hands to work. We need feet for balance. We need strong legs and back to help carry the load. We need eyes and ears to see and, and, and hear what's going around us. But have you ever can really considered the internal workings of our body? We have the brain. We have the heart, the nervous system. We have kidneys, a spleen, blood. We have digestive system, gallbladder, lungs, skeletal system, you know, appendix. And it just list goes on and on that I don't know anything about. I don't know much about Let me rephrase that. I, I, I was seeking some information, so I, I, I called the medical professional that I know. My daughter, she's a nurse. And she started talking about these, some of these different things using words and descriptions that I don't know about. I said, whoa, <laughs> slow down. And uh, the one in particular, which I'll get to in a little bit, was the heart. She's talking about the heart and the, using her technical terms. And I'm just like, I don't understand this. And her husband was on the phone. He's listening. He says, it's kind of like a water pump in your engine. <laughs> now I got it. Now, now I got it. But can you imagine? I mean, they, the whole body works together. It's, it's formed together and it works together. But imagine if the brain and the nervous system did not work together. One sends signals and the other processes the signal and sends back. What if it didn't work together? What if you laid your hand on a hot stove? And it didn't send the message to the brain. What if it sent the message to the brain, the brain processed and said, well, I, think, I don't think I'm going to tell the, body, the hand to move. What would happen? Of course, we'd be burnt badly. So it works together. We don't even think about it. You touch a hot stove, your hand's off. You get a jolt of electricity, you're jumping back. God works this, worked that so well. He, 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 he created us marvelously. What happens when the kidney and the blood don't work, don't work together? One gives life, and the other purifies that blood that gives life. If the kidneys don't work, the blood is pumping through the body, sending a disease everywhere. And if you're not familiar with that, I've got a friend that really, I'm really close to, does dialysis three times a week because his kidneys aren't working. He has to have his blood filtered three times a week, four hours every time. And then imagine, now some of you might like this part of it, but he goes in to get his blood filtered. He comes out 15 pounds lighter. But he's drained. That fluid that wasn't able to process out was taken off and then immediately he's drained. But God, again, in his greatness, created it together. What about the skeletal system? We stand, I stand before you today, and although you can't see it, I can't see it, I'm made up of bones, of course, 206 bones. There's cartilage, there's ligaments, there's muscles. Everyone joined together, holding us together. God knew what he was doing. Reading from the Amplified Bible, and I say that because 
I'll use the King James or the New King James. Even when I read the New King James, I speak it in King James because that's how I, how I came to Christ. All right, so yeah, we're, we're good there. Where was I? Okay, the reading from the Amplified Bible. Chris sent me a... It relaxed me last week. I never noticed this before, but did you know he reads his notes sometimes? He comes back to his notes. I always thought people just got there and spoke, and I thought, wow, how do they do that? <laughs> Anyhow, back to the Amplified. This, from him, the whole body, joined and knitted firmly together by what every joint supplies. When each part is working properly, it causes the body to grow and mature building itself up in love. God took our skeletal system and put it all together. One other part of the body is electrolytes. Electrolytes are little compounds and, and, and minerals that are electrically charged, and they're in every cell of your body. And that's small. You put it under a microscope, it's really small. But imagine just electrolyte in your blood. If it's low, it affects your whole system. It can cause fatigue, Confusion, headaches, an irregular or fast heartbeat, muscle weakness, numbness and tingling, even irritability. So if your spouse brings you some Gatorade this week, it's a clue. <laughs> it's a clue. You're a little bit irritable today. Back to the heart, because I couldn't understand the heart, but I did, I did clean a few things. There's one our heart, which is about the size of our fist, or your fist, that's how big your heart is, it pumps between one and a half and two gallons a minute through your body, every minute of your life, whether you're awake or whether you're sleeping. 50 years, 70 years, 100 years, that muscle is working, the blood is flowing. And when that blood stops flowing, we die. And that's because that life is in the blood. And Christ's blood applied to us, our heart not only gives us life, it gives us abundant, yeah. abundant life. Technical difficulties again. <laughs> I know the clicker's working, yeah. <laughs> it's about time that we know the appointed times. We're talking about the greatness of God, and this message is about time, but we should know the appointed times. And I said, speaking of time, does anyone have the time? But I look back on the clock and found out it's 11.53. <clears throat> The current year we're living in, of course, we know is 2022. Besides Michael Johnson, does anybody know the biblical year? I say that because I know he'd know about it. It's 5782. And sometime next week, it switches over to 58 or 5783. How about the time of the season? I don't need a calendar. I've been walking through the woods. I see the leaves falling. Some mornings are a little bit cooler than they have been. Everything's about time, and God has appointed time. He is the time keeper. There are several calendars, but God has the correct calendar. Our calendar, we have 365 days a year, and of course, every four years, we have one extra day known as leap year. The biblical calendar, or some call it the biblical lunar calendar, has 354 days a year, 11 days less than ours. But... Over a 19-year cycle, there's, seven, there's a month, extra month every, in, at seven times through that 19 years, it's a continual cycle. And the reason for that is, or they actually the must call the DAR2, and the reason for that extra month every three to, two to three years, because in Exodus we read, you shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. God had an appointed time for everything that he had, he had a had a purpose for it. When we look at the biblical festivals, they center around a season. We think about the spring feast. And I don't know a lot about all the feasts. I'll tell you that right up front. I learned a little bit. I've learned a little bit. I've, I'm learning more. But they're just really, they're an added blessing to us would come to Christ. The churches I was in never, never taught anything about it. In the last couple of years, I've heard about God's appointed time, about God's calendar, about his day timer. And one we have is the spring, we have the spring feast. We have the Passover, which is God redeeming his people out of Egyptian slavery. And of course, we see Christ as he's our Passover lamb. 
It's the beginning of new life. It's, a, it's, a, it's a free, freeing us from a life of bondage and sin. And then there's the feast of unleavened bread, which pointed to, of course, Christ's sinless life. And leaven is symbolic of sin. It spreads. If you're making bread and you put leaven in it, it's going to spread through the whole loaf. If we have sin in our heart, it'll spread through our whole body. It'll spread through our whole church. It'll spread through our whole nation. It doesn't stop growing. And unleavened bread, in unleavened bread, there is no corruption. How many of you knew that unleavened bread doesn't decay? It doesn't mold. It's pure. You can put it on the shelf and come back a year later and you can still eat it. Galatians 5.9 reads, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. In the past two months, this is from my experience, from what I've dealt with, there's been so much demonic activity. There's been oppression. A Christian possessed. The things that I'm dealing with, and I know the other pastors are dealing with different things, and I'm thinking, why? Why is it all happening now? And the one that really struck me was, how can a Christian be demon-possessed? I know they could be oppressed, but I never heard that before. And so I was talking to a friend of mine who, who works in this deliverance. He says, what happens is, is when we clean ourselves out, when we repent, when we give, turn everything over to God, there might be one thing that we hold back, that we hide, that we put in the back closet, we lock it up in the safe, and it opens the door for that spirit to come in. And there's been a lot of different things happening. So just a little bit of leaven will destroy the whole loaf. Then we have the Feast of First Fruits, which came three days, three days after Pentecost, or before Pentecost. I got that wrong. Passover. I have to look at my notes. Three days after Passover is the first fruit. First fruits of Jesus resurrected from the dead. And I know it was a spring feast. It was, it, first fruit was a wave offering, talking about God's provision or sharing about God's provision for us. During that, during the Israelis, during the time they were in the desert, God still provided for them. And the fourth feast, spring feast, was Pentecost. It came 50 days after first fruits, and it pointed to the great harvest. For us, the great harvest of souls, both Jew and Gentile. Pentecost is also known as the anniversary of the law being given on Mount Sinai. We know it as a church. It was when God poured out his spirit upon flesh, upon all flesh. He poured out his spirit. It's basically, it's God's law written on our hearts. You know, we, don't, we can go to the scripture, and if you want to know what sin is, there's a list of sin. Go to the Old Testament, don't breathe. If you're wearing clothes that are different, different fabrics, you're in trouble. But we live by grace, God's grace. We're now entering into the fall season, the fall seasons of the Lord's appointed times. There's a starting soon. I don't understand all of it, but it's called the 10 days of awe, like in awe, some God, the 10 days of awe. It includes Rosh Hashanah, which is a Jewish new year. It's a time of reflection, a time of repentance. And of course, we always hear the, feast, the sound of the trumpets or the, the feast of trumpets. And then it goes into the feast of tabernacles. There's repent, reflection, there's repentance. There's a sounding of a trumpet to signify that new year's coming. And then there's the feast of tabernacles, a time of celebration, a time of coming together, coming in together. And to begin that, Rosh Hashanah, Jesus has said it many times through scripture, no man knows the day or the hour. They knew about when it was going to come from the previous months and different things, but they didn't know. And so they would send two priests up into the hills looking, just looking at night for that first sliver of light in the new moon. And they had two because you had to have two witnesses. And when they saw that, then the trumpet began to blow or the shafar. I was going to bring one today, but I forgot I gave it to another nonprofit. And, uh, but they blow that trumpet. And when that trumpet begins to blow, everybody knows it is New Year. It's time to begin. The ten, it's the 10 days of awe, all those things coming in. Reading in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I'm going to take this, my Bible and do that. Okay. 
That's because I'm in chapter 3 there. That's why. Verse 13. But I do not, want, do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say unto you by the, by, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain will be, will be coming to the Lord Boy, I'm, I'm trying to read in King James if this is really. Let me read it here. <laughs> okay, I was in the wrong verse. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangels and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds to meet him, meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Many Bible scholars believe that Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpet, is at the time, the appointed time that the Lord's going to come. I, I know people that are looking for next week because they got a lot of stuff coming on. If the Lord comes then, they're done. I mean, they're, they've got it made. But we don't know that. No man knows that day or the hour. We can know the seasons. We can see what's going on about it. But no man knows the day or the hour. So my next slide is, it's about time that we know the signs of the time. Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 1 says, but in the last days will be perilous times. This slide says we have to redeem the time because the days are evil. In Matthew chapter 24, if anybody's read that, or maybe Mark chapter 13, the disciples we're at the temple and they're showing Jesus the great things on the temple. And Jesus makes a comment, I tell you, there's not going to be one stone left upon another. And then a little bit later, it says the disciples came to him privately asking, Jesus, tell us, when will these things be? Will it be the sign of your troubles, of your, of your coming? Does anybody know the first thing that Jesus said to him? A lot of us know the signs, but the first thing he said Take heed that no one deceive you. There are so many things of deception going on all around us. But he said, take heed that no one deceive you. And then he goes into a list. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famine, pestilence, which is the same as a pandemic. Hated by all nations for my namesake. Many false prophets. Lawlessness. Has anybody noticed that crime has gone up? Violence has gone up? I don't know all the statistics in different areas, but I know just a hundred miles down the road, crime or murder is up 200% over last year. We don't see that here. We don't see it. We don't see it, but we don't see it as much. And plus, all these, there's homelessness. Now, homelessness has been here forever. In Christ's time, it was homelessness. I've been to third world countries. I've seen the homelessness. But I can tell you this, I've never really noticed it on my, street, or my town, in my city. You drive down I-5, you see it. You go up by the hospital, you see it. And there's different reasons for it. You know, there's, it's, it's economic turn, downturn. You know, it's, it's a lot, used to be years ago, when my wife used to go downtown and serve the homeless. It was young kids that thought it was cool to be homeless. And now, you know, the, things are happening and beyond control. And then there's the homelessness. There's also, it ties back to the crime. Because I lived in Fairbanks, the cold part of Alaska. My brother-in-law worked at the hospital, or not the hospital, the jail. And he was, he was a nurse at the jail. And he would tell us that in the wintertime, or the summertime, it's, it's 24 hours of daylight. It's warm. It's nice. But when it came wintertime, they didn't have a place to go. So they commit a crime. They get thrown in jail or the correctional facility for six months. And they're let out in the spring. And then they go back. They do whatever they want in the summer. And winter comes again. They commit a crime. They get thrown back in jail. But now you commit a crime, you're released on cashless bail. Just go back out. We're not going to take care of you anymore. And so crime has to increase because they have to take care of their need. They have to have a place to stay. They have to buy something. And that's why it's, I think it's all coming together. We have division 
We have racial division. We have political division. We have class division. We have even have age division. This age against that age. This color against that color. This race against that race. This group of, of Republicans, Democrats against each other and independents against both. There's so much division. I submit these are perilous times. Yeah. Anybody disagree? Just think about in the last several years, government control or government overreach. Shut your business down. Shut your church down. This church was born out of that because, no, we want to worship God. We want to gather together because without gathering together, we get weak. Yeah. We'll fall. We need to be together, knitted together, encouraging one another, lifting one another up. And that's the purpose for that. If it hadn't been for Edwin Snowden, how many would have known they're spying on your emails and your text messages? We have a president labeling half the, half the country terrorist. And there might be some here, but I'm not worried. We have security. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's talk about digital currency in December or maybe early next year. Your dollar bills are no good. Just found out last week they're going to start tracking certain sales on your credit cards, what you can buy and what you can't buy. Our phones. Now, I, 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 honest, I love my phone. I got the world at my fingertips. Yeah. I can do my banking. I can buy on Amazon. I can sell on eBay. You know, if I have a question about something, I type it in, I get education. It's all right there on my phone. And some people think 5G is really bad because it messes with your electrolytes in your body. If you think 5G is bad, just wait till 6G comes. You won't have to hold it in your hand or put it next to your forehead. It'll be implanted. Now, I just made that up, so don't go researching that. Okay, I just want you to know. I, I, I just made that up. I thought for sure somebody's going to go looking for it. However, however, I'm not going to allow any of those things to take my eyes off the prize. It's time we start take our eyes off of those things and look to Christ. Romans, these words are written, Romans chapter 8. For I am persuaded, this is me, I am persuaded personally that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height or depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jude wrote, if you read the book of Jude, he talked about in the last day, it'd be mockers. There's been mockers for how long? Oh, that's been said for 2,000 years. Now, I've heard that before. Religion is just for those who have weak minds. Oh, my grandparents said the same thing. Or... That's a crazy thing to believe, just mocking. But all these things that we just talked about, Jesus talked about, after all that, he said, but the end is not yet. It means it's going to get worse. And people are looking for that, are, are looking, thinking, why? But if you look back, if you think about it, all these things have been going on for how long? Thousands of years. We've had lawlessness and homelessness, and we've, we've had riots, we've had wars, we had all these different things. But Jesus, after all that, he listed all those, he started to talk again in Matthew and in Mark. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When the branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things, know that the end is near at the doors. Uh, surely I tell you, this generation will by no means pass away till these things take place. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Those things have been happening, and they've been looking, and they're looking for Christ. I'm looking for Christ. But there's one thing that changes everything of all those things happening. Never in the history of the world has such a thing happened before. But God always keeps his word. Noah had never seen rain before, but God kept his word. What did Jesus say? Going back to that verse, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will never pass away. It's there. As definitely foretold by, in Mark and Matthew, the prophecy of Ezekiel has come true. 
Never before in history has this one prophecy been fulfilled. Breaking news. May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation. Established in the first Jewish state in 2,000 years. Recognized as a nation. And here's the neat thing. It was actually born on one day. And they tried to destroy it on day one. But that nation was born. Was, was, was born. And Jesus said, that, what did Jesus say again? This generation shall not pass away. After you see the fig tree budding. Is that our time? I don't know. How long is a generation? I remember hearing when I came to Christ, it's 40 years. In the 80s, I was looking for Jesus. Some say 70 to 80 years. I don't know. And yet others say, seven, say 120 years, a generation. I don't know, but I do know one thing. It's more than 74 years of our time. 74 years ago, they became a nation. But Jesus kept going to keep his word. Generation is not going to pass away. First Peter chapter 3 reads this. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. This one gets me. But the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. But as long suffering to us were, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. How many have come to Christ in the last 30 years? Raise your hand. In the last 30 years you came to Christ. If a generation was 40 years, you'd be lost. You'd be gone. You'd be suffering so much. But Christ is going to keep his words, but he's not, he's not slack. He's drawn in as many as he possibly can. And I have a friend that says this a lot. They say, I'm, I'm just a whosoever. I'm not special. I'm just a whosoever. How many can quote John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have our left in life. I'm just a whosoever. As I look back through the history, the apostles were looking for Jesus. But the apostles had gone by the way of the grave. Many generations have been looking for the return of Christ. But they went by the way of the grave. And here we are today. I'm looking for the return of Jesus. I am. Hebrews 12, 1 reads, Therefore we, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those before us, let us lay aside the weight and sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance. Keep running. Keep going. The race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, now, I am still looking for him to return while I'm alive. But if I go by the way of the grave, I've told my wife this. I want my epitaph to read. Sincerely, I want it to read, man of prayer, now face to face. I'm going to see him. Whether he comes in the clouds or I go by the way of the grave, I am going to see him. <laughs> Technical difficulties again. <laughs> Sherry's try. She's trying to keep up with me. We're racing against the time. We're racing against God's appointed time against his time clock. And I thought about that. In our life, we think, well, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to accomplish this. And we're just going and racing. We have all these modern conveniences. We have cars. We have trains. We have planes that just fly. And I worked on a lot of aircraft, and I just enjoyed. I could leave Alaska and be in Germany in six hours. I could leave there, and I could be in Okinawa in six hours, eight hours. All over the world, quick, quick, quick. All these things, we still need to take time to slow down. It's about time. It's about time we went from being just faithful to faith-filled. Many of us are faithful. We come to church, we pay our taxes, we go to work, we support our family, we do good things, we feed the hungry. We're being faithful. But what about faith-filled? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Anybody have a hope for something? Anybody have a hope they want to happen? By faith, it's part of that. It's about time we understand the power of the name given to us. 
the name of Jesus. Sets captives free, heals the sick, raises the dead. Many years ago, I had a friend of mine. We're having a Christmas party at our house with our two of our two small groups. And we're at our house, and I'm outside, and I'm, I'm talking to a man. I'm praying with him, and my neighbor comes home. He comes home, and we're outside talking. And I said, well, why don't you come on inside? We're having a party. We've got lots of food. You know, you, why don't you enjoy it? No, 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 no. My wife has something for me. He walks into his house. And so I'm outside talking to this young man, sharing with him. He's going through a difficult time, trying to encourage him. And I could hear the, the, the wailing in the background. And I thought, wow, the coyotes are close tonight. Because we lived, we lived by a golf course. Lots of coyotes came through there. And I'm thinking, wow, they're really close because I could hear the howling. And I'm talking to him. And I laid my hand on his shoulder. I was going to pray with him. I laid my hand on his shoulder. And I said, Lord Jesus... And instantly, that howling was right next to me. I could feel it. I could hear it. And it wasn't coyotes. It was my neighbor's wife coming out of the house. She had a phone to her head, and she's just wailing. Her husband came in, picked something up, said, what's this? She answered. He didn't answer back. Several minutes went by. She went in. She got up out of the chair. She went in. He was on the floor. He was dead. And I, I went, what happened? What happened? She kept saying her name, husband's name. And so BJ and I went in. We rushed in the house, and there he was. He was on the floor. He was a blue-gray color. It had been almost four minutes. And all I could think of was military training. You, go get help. No heartbeat, no breath. CPR. CPR is exhausting. And he went across the street to get help because we had people there. We had nurses. We had people at the street. And I'm sitting and I'm doing CPR. And if you've ever done CPR on somebody, it's, it's, it's work. It is labor. It, is, it, is, it just drains your strength. And it seemed like five minutes went by. And I'm, just, I'm praying. I'm, I'm just doing what I know to do. I'm beating. I'm doing his chest. He just had open heart surgery six months prior. I could feel the bones, the cartilage crunching. But I knew it was a life-saving measure. I'm doing all I can do. And it's not working. I'm giving breath. He's not coming to life. And some other people came in. One grabbed his hand. And before they came in, I just, Lord Jesus, I can't do this. He'd been out for four minutes without any circulation in his blood. And God brought him back to life. Hallelujah. I told our pastor, I said, at our, at our Christmas parties, we raise the dead. <laughs> and... And, you know, God gave him seven more years. But during that seven years, one time, I had that experience with death myself. I'm not going to go into the details, but my wife was sharing with, with him about my death and my experience. And he made a comment. He said, well, that didn't happen to me. Everything just went black, went dark. And I told him, I said, well, maybe you weren't headed in that direction. And his upbringing, he was just so upset. He was mad. He was really upset about it. But you know what? It got him to thinking. He gave his heart to Christ. He rededicated. He gave his life to Christ, and God gave him about seven more years. It's about time. We use the power of that name. It's about time we declare victory. Victory over addiction. Victory over depression. Victory over doubt. Victory over fear. Victory over lies. That little whisper in your head, oh, you can't do that. You're not good enough. Who are you? Victory over all those things. God is the keeper of time. And I ask myself this question, how much time do I have left? We don't know. We just found out a couple weeks ago, Brother John passed away, went home. Everything was fine. Gone. We don't know. Jesus may come back for me and I'll be alive. Or I may be going through the way of the grave. He might come for me today. I don't know. In Luke chapter 7, there's this talks about a day in the life of Christ. And I, I read that and I just thought about that. What a day. I mean, he had a full day. He healed the centurion's servant. They sent, they sent messengers, come and heal his servant. And before he ever got there, the, the, the commander, 
the Roman commander sent people out to Jesus saying, don't even bother coming to my house. I'm a man in authority. I understand these things. You speak the word, it'll happen. And Jesus always used it as a teaching moment. He says, wow, I haven't found greater faith, not even in Israel. Israel had been looking for the Messiah for years, but yet they've given up hope. After that, they go into the city and there's a funeral procession going on. And the mother's weeping because it's her only son. And Jesus says, don't weep. And he touches the open casket. Everybody stops. He grabs the young man's head and says, arise. Brings him back to life. One day. Whew, what a day. And then here comes the disciples of John the Baptist to him. John sent us. He wants to know, are you the one or should we look for another? Jesus didn't respond. But during that same hour, he turned around and he cleansed the leper. He opened the blinded eyes. He unstopped the deaf ear. He helped the lame to walk. He did all these things. And then he turns around and he said, go tell John the things that you've seen, the dead are raised, hearings given, lame are leaping, and the gospels preached to the poor. That's it's encouragement that John needed. John was, okay, I'm ready to go. Take my head. I'm ready to go. And the day's almost finished when he gets an invitation to dinner. And Jesus, being who he was, he came to dinner. And then, it says there's a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she knew that Jesus sat at the table, she brought the only things she had left tears, and oil. It's all she had. And the Bible says she went in kneeling at his feet, washing his feet with her tears, wiping them with her head, kissing his feet, and anointing them with oil. And the people around him thinking, oh, if he only knew about her, he would allow this to happen. But here's what they didn't know. They didn't know that she knew who he was and made all the difference. I'd like you to stand. I'll not just stand, I don't want you to come gather around the front. I want you to come in close. We're a family, we can need to come in close. And as you're coming in, I wanna share three points three important points of the parable of the 10 virgins, the bride of Christ, the future bride of Christ. They were all part of the bridal party. They were all invited in. They were already pure. They were part, like us, the church. They all had lamps, lamps to light the way. We have the word, thy lamp is a light unto my pathway, a word into, light into my heart word in my pathway. It's a light. But half of them ran out of oil. And I'm thinking, how? How could you possibly run out of oil knowing that the bridegroom's going to come anytime? You had to be prepared. How to be ready? Why? Why didn't you go out during the day and buy some? Why didn't you have a stockpile? Why didn't you prepare? And then when? When did you become complacent? When did you think, oh, it's not gonna happen now, it's not gonna happen today? He's been gone for a long time. And then I have a question to ask each and every one of you, only you can answer, only I can answer. How's your oil level? Is it about to run out? Is it full? Or do you really just don't care? Pastor Chris. As we come together, not knowing everything that Rick was going to share, I chose a song that actually speaks to the fact that throughout all eternity, there's a song that's being sung. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And no matter where you're at in your life, it's just one step forward into eternity and to join the vein of, of the flow of worship today and in purity and just sing to the God of all creation who He is, who He is to you. The never-changing God that is never 
early and he's never late, has always met your need where you're at, who mends hearts, heals bodies, opens eyes, brings sight to the blind. And he cares for you in every moment of your life he's cared for you. And for a thousand generations, we can join in that worship to him today. And just let the Spirit of God just move on you. I don't know what you've done with your life, what errors you've made, but there is one decision that can correct it all. And his name is Jesus. And today we just sing to the one who is worthy. And for a thousand generations, fall down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land. Yeah. 
is a high is your name is a greatest your name it stands above the all it's all thrones and dominion for all thrones and dominion all power and position your name is his name that stands above it all all the angels cry all the angels cry today right now we just lift up our hearts to you right where we are Lord you are the great and awesome God who sits upon the throne before us now Lord give us victory over addiction give us victory over depression for now is the appointed time not just the chronos Lord will we watch the calendar of the day but your kairos your perfect time your perfect will your spirit prompts us right now for today is the day of your salvation today is the day that you can turn your heart your mind and your decision to him for all authority is his and his alone let his authority work in your life give him room even as Rick was sharing that one thing that you've held back that thing that you've placed somewhere behind in a closet and locked it up so the enemy has no foothold and no place any longer. Just surrender it to him. Give it to him right now. That bitterness that you hold on in your heart, that unforgiveness that you've not let go, that addiction that holds you, that you think you have a hold of. Give it to him. And thank you, Father God, for your holy, holy, holy. Your name is above every name. And it's your love that you sent to this world through your son to give us hope and to give us a future an eternity where a song will be sung holy 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 is the lord god almighty holy 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 is the lord god he your people sing and hear your people sing holy to the King of Kings, He is holy, and you will always be holy. You're holy forever. He's holy forever. You will always be holy. God is good, is he not? Amen. Let him know that you love him this morning. Come on. You are worthy, God. You are worthy of this place. As we end our service, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Amen. Amen.